we went over. Jim, excuse me just yes. one minute. We start off just with saying that today is February the 14th, um, 2005. We are at the Atlanta History Center right. in Atlanta, Georgia, and I am Neil O'Brien Tozer, and Henry Lamar Howell is with me, and we are going to interview Mr. James Lewis Alston, who is a veteran of World War II, and our families have been <coughs> friends for many, many years, both Henry's family and my family with all the Alstons, yeah. so it's a wonderful yeah. time to get together and finally interview you. Yeah. We're delighted about it. Where shall we begin? What do you think, Henry? Well, maybe we should begin with a little bit about the Alstons in Atlanta, because you all have just been such an important family for so long here. Absolutely. In those days, people came here from other places. And my mother was visiting uh, her, grand her father from Greenville, South Carolina, where the first cousin of Mr. Wayman, who lived over on 14th Street, which was a big residential area from Piedmont up to Peach Street. And uh, he, my father was about to resign from the 9 o'clock uh, party when Mr. Wayman asked him to take his guest to the, her costume, Maud Mother she was, whatever it was, to the 9 o'clock party. And so they started courting then, back and forth. And uh, it was finally you know, got married on the 10th of uh, September, 10th of uh, the 10th of uh, June, June, no, 10th of June. They got married on the 10th of June in Greenville. Uh -huh. And his father came over from Alabama and his mother's family was from Greenville there for the wedding. And uh, they took off for uh, Niagara Falls for their honeymoon, which was a style of the two that they then he started building a house, and as a brother, first of all, though, he, when he finished at Alabama, he went to, to his friends over to Birmingham to start the law practice. But his brother, older brother, had already started the law practice in Atlanta about 1892. <coughs> and he wrote him and said, if you'll come over here, I'll guarantee you $10 a week. Oh. Oh. After the Civil War, you know, there wasn't much money around. And so uh, my father came, and that's why he did some work for Mr. Wayman, and he asked him to take him over to the 9 o'clock board. And uh, they had a big place on 14th Street. No, there was days of uh, talk. There was no radio, no, uh, no, uh, TV. None of that. They, they talk and have two shifts of service, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, uh, but they took time to build a house, and my uh, uncle was worried about how he's going to heat it. But he said he's going to try it. So they lived around two or three places while the house was being finished uh, from different people. One of his apartments and houses. And uh, finally got in the house for uh, Philip, I think, on the 11th. Philip was the oldest yeah, of your the 11th family. 11th. And Bernie was his second oldest. Mm -hmm. And I was the third. And Anne was the fourth. And Bob was the fifth. And Bob was the first one to die. That all right. Yeah. Just Very. all right. We saw him, a lot of him in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> he was in, I met him to fly P-38s. And he got uh, uh, one of Larry there to go back to the States about March uh, and uh, teach uh, P-38s in one of the airfields in Colorado or New Mexico, somewhere in the West. Mm -hmm. So he came through uh, uh, London after winning poker and had the, the uh, uh, Air, Air Force uh, salary. And we covered Europe, I mean, covered London 
all one night. They began taking the cloth off the table. The music had quit. They would go somewhere else. And go somewhere else. <laughs> Next morning, I went up to see him off uh, to uh, Atlanta. And he said, why don't you marry her? I said, well, maybe I will. Well, we got engaged before he got to Atlanta. He was expecting a big welcome in Atlanta. When he arrived, the first thing they said, what's Lucille like? <laughs> That was the first thing on their minds. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know why, but I had thought you were the youngest. No, I was in the middle. You were in the middle. The only one I didn't know was Bernie. Yeah, Bernie. Bernie married uh, one of the Jurens from Greenville, a very prominent family of that. He was a big doctor. Mm -hmm. And he wanted a car after the war. And of course, there were no cars around him. But somebody found a Chrysler for him. And they put on a parade in Greenville with the Chrysler for Dr. Jerry. And his son, who headed from medical school, they had met in Washington. She was at Dunstan Hall and he was at the University of Virginia. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to go to medical school, but he went to work $15 a week in a mill in Greenville because they were getting married. Mother had a lot from the old place up there. She gave that to them. Daddy gave him some money to build a house, a small house. And, uh, she lost three children. Uh, her blood pressure would drop. We had to bring on the babies. Mm -hmm. uh, terrible. Uh, but, uh, uh, That's Bernie's wife. Yeah. yeah. And did Bernie serve in the war at all? No. 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 But all three of your, the three Atlanta yeah. males. He still was in the Navy. In LCI he had to go to Europe. He couldn't come to our wedding. He came to our announcement. Philip in London. This was Philip. Philip. When? In our, announce, in our announcement at the Grover House, our engagement. And then he, but he couldn't get there for the wedding because he was seated on the ship. It was only four days for the day. He couldn't come up to the ship. He yeah. was incommunicado. Uh -huh. Right. And uh, so we couldn't get out of town because, uh, and the Americans couldn't come out to come in to fulfill at the hotel. So Lucy called up the uh, Savoy Hotel and says, this is the American Embassy, we'd like a room for two nights. So that's where we spent our It's an elegant place to go. <laughs> Wonderful place to go. And, uh, we, went, we went back 50 years later and they said our policy is to give you free uh, room for two nights for we hadn't been here during the war. But I couldn't give them any information, but they still took us. Here to the room for two nights. And then uh, we uh, left and went to visit some friends in Bedford, where my relatives over there come from. And they, these folks had a big place, country place there. That's she was lovely. married to an American, I mean to an Englishman. She was an American from well, let's go back a little bit. So, your mother and father had five children in seven years. Yeah. And you grew up, of course, right here in Ansley Park, uh -huh. in Atlanta, Ansley Park, in the same house yeah. where you were born. Yeah. And then where did you go to school? Well, I went to Spring Street. Yeah, uh -huh. And we cut through people's yards and backyards, no, no meals, they didn't get around to serve us with milk or anything. Mm -hmm. And we got, took shortcuts from Peachtree Circle through by people's deep yard and across uh, Piedmont, I mean across Peachtree Street mm -hmm. and down 18th Street to Spring Street School, mm -hmm. which is still there. Yes, it is. I take my grandchildren there to the puppet shows. Yeah, puppet shows. Uh -huh. That's right. And then I went to, from there I went to O'Keefe. And then my mother was able to get me into Episcopal High School in Virginia because the Depression was on and they'd take anybody that could pay their way. <laughs> so you graduated from Episcopal? No, I just was there for three years. Oh, yes. They were glad to get rid of me and so oh, Jim. I, I went to the University of Georgia then. All right. And I got into that somehow. Uh -huh. I was no really not a good student. 
but uh, it is those days. Um, it's so different now at the University of Georgia. You, I couldn't get in there now. <laughs> I stayed with you then, and uh, I stayed with it to uh, 36 when I graduated. And, uh, and that's when I, my first trip to Europe, one of the people in my room in, in Athens, Athens would uh, join a group to go to uh, uh, a trip to Europe with an older group and a younger group. But we all sort of got, got along pretty well. And uh, we covered everything except uh, uh, Spain and, and uh, Italy. Spain is when the revolution broke out while we were in Norway, I think. And, uh, well, but I did I'd been in the army. Well, did you then go to law school after the University of Georgia? Yeah. Good part of it there, but most of it was Emory. Emory Law School. Mm -hmm. I'd been away for six years, so that's that. Come yeah. home for that. So you graduated from Emory Law School. That's right. All right. So when the war came, you were an attorney. Yeah. And were you yeah, already... Yeah, I'd been practicing about a year. Were you practicing with the Alston firm? Uh, yeah. So. But it's far different from what it is now. Oh, gosh, yeah. All right, how many people were in the firm when you went in? Oh, about ten. Just amazing. And we used to have early part, Christmas parties, depending on the crowd. And first they went to somebody's house, then they got somewhere else, somewhere else. Finally, they gave up too many people. I don't think they have a Christmas party anymore. We've got about six or seven hundred lawyers now. It's just staggering. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, uh, but I'd been in the Army uh, <clears throat> for a year before I went overseas. And uh, that was quite an experience. This was 42, spring, summer of 42. And the group they got, some had never ridden on a train before. Some couldn't read or write. One had a sore back, he said, from hauling sugar to the still in North of the Alabama mountains. To the still. Yeah. yeah. And uh, 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 one of them had made $100 a week building the, the building at Camp Wheeler at, at Maple. Well, he got in at $21 a month, once a day, once a week, once a day. Yeah. And he was in trouble all the time. <laughs> Having made $100 a week and get down to $21 for a whole month. <laughs> Big change. But there, uh, but you were, so you were drafted yeah. in the army because you were single. Huh? Yeah. And well, being that, that was one reason. Uh, I had a, a low draft number. Mm -hmm. and, so you were drafted. And, 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 and unmarried too. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Who did he call, call the sports writer? He said, you'll just be in here a year. But as I say, if I stay, if I got that after the year, I would not have that big seal. Then when we got to England, we went over on a cruise ship that carried about 500 people in peacetime, and we had about 5,000 on there. Oh. And we had the uh, duck, double, triple duck bunks on the decks as well as the state rooms. And we went in a convoy. Some days we'd be spread out, some days we'd be spread this way. Had a big battleship in the meantime. And, uh, um, we landed, went up the uh, Clyde River to Glasgow, went all the way, and we, we moved around in England two or three places before we hit on uh, Cheltenham, which is a horse country, and not far from Oxford. And we uh, nice uh, Cotswolds, and uh, we landed Cheltenham, and I was still in the mail room there, and one day I ran into this soldier. He well, was a lawyer in Atlanta named Hugh Head. He said, we just started the claim service, I was part of the Judge Africa, here in Cheltenham. I want to get you in as an officer. I'll put you before three officers. Well, if I hadn't met him, I still wouldn't have met Lucille. So they got me a new place to live, a uniform, and we rode around and followed what the British were handling their claims. 
and pretty soon, after a couple of months, the man in, in uh, Cuba, Pearl, who family was connected with the embassy, he had taken over in London, and he ordered me to, uh, to uh, London. And if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't have met his daughter, who had a birthday, and he, he invited me to her birthday for a 21st birthday. It was quite a big deal, wasn't it? So I went to the birthday party, and here sitting across the way was Lucille. And she'd seen me in my uniform because I was billeted in her neighborhood. She wondered who I was. And then about 3 o'clock we went to a bottle party across the street from the doctor's house. We went to a bottle party. And about 3 o'clock she and her date were getting ready to leave, and I knew if I was going to get home without walking. I just crowd in with them, which I did. And then we started supporting each other since after that. We well, found out where she lived yeah, yeah. and everything. Everything. Yeah, I, I was not far away where I lived. The ability to live at home. And uh, uh, if, I hadn't, if I hadn't run into that uh, officer in uh, Cheltenham. And then in your reminiscences that I enjoyed reading, and we'll leave a copy with the History Center here. You said that Bob Pegram was one, of, was one of the three officers. That's incredible coincidence, he was, too. He was killed in the Paris plane crash. Yes, I know. I yeah. see his daughter. Yeah, he was one of the three officers. I, am. I didn't have any trouble getting uh, approved, and uh, I then we got a new uniform and a new place to live, and uh, was doing very well. The whole thing was a stroke of luck. Yeah. And uh, all your Atlanta then, acquaintances. Uh, after, uh, after being in, uh, we met. We met in June of '43. We. Uh, you and Lucille. Yeah, and we uh, got engaged. In June of 43. And June of 44 was just four days before D Day. And her colonel, she was working for the embassy then, and the, uh, they had told her they'd give her a job if she learned shorthand and typing, thinking they'd get rid of it. But she got <laughs> on as a, as a secretary to the uh, military attaché for ordnance at, at the uh, embassy. And uh, that's why you get all kinds of uh, Perks being the embassy, not because I was in the army. And uh, so we, uh, uh, I had to wait a couple of months. I guess they didn't want me to be married for Fuzzy or something. But uh, we got to, went to the uh, church that was in the square there where the army and navy, American army and navy, had their offices all around the square there. Eisenhower and Platts or something like that. And, uh, Went to see the uh, rector there to tell him we wanted to get married and so forth. And, uh, this is St. Mark's Church. Mm -hmm, St. Mark's. It's no church in there longer. Oh. Yeah. I don't know if that people lose the way or something. Mm -hmm. But Tony Crawford, with his brother, was in the Parliament. But he was the rector there. And uh, he found out that Lucia was Catholic, and I was not. And he said, well, what you need to do is find out how you're going to raise the children. <clears throat> so we split them up. The girl went one way to Lucy, and the boy went the other way to me. Was that prearrangement? You all decided that yeah. up front? Yeah. Uh, he was born over there, and she was born over here. Yeah. Amanda. Right. So he's still at St. Luke's with you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's been on the vestry. It takes up collection and moves around. Well, obviously, meeting Lucille was the big event of the war for you. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, her maiden name was Vogt, V O G T. Yeah, it's a and German name, I think. And his wife always called him that Heine. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and he they represented. Got, they got married at the little church around the corner in New York City. I don't know what that was. Uh -huh. But he was, he had been born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky. And he went to Columbia to school and he loved it the theater. He got an extra job to the theater on the stage. Then he comes down here. He, he took over the business in New York City. But he wanted to see what Lucy was going to get into. She hadn't come yet. So he came down to visit us in Atlanta. And there was no place to stay except Mother knew Miss Hanson at the billboard. And she found a room for him. But there were no rooms. Hotel rooms. Yeah. And so he, he, we went out to lunch one day with my father. And he runs into two people. One was running the Champ General, I forget what his name was, and the other was a treasurer of Habitus. They had both been in, in the Little Bill of Kentucky High School with him. That's amazing. George Biggers. Yeah, George Biggers was right. the president. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And so that was, he sent off and got a photographer for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Atlanta passed muster. He was. It was okay for Lucille to, to come to Atlanta after that. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he had, uh, but he, he met my, all my family. But Lucille's parents were, he was the businessman in London yeah. before the two, war. He had two shops for E.B. Meyerowitz, a New York Polish lifestyle places. And they sent him over. He had two shops in London and two shops in Paris. And he got over to Paris pretty regular because he liked the way the Parisians uh, relax and enjoy life. <laughs> and one of the, one of the uh, several girls, she went to finishing school in Paris. And one of the girls, several of them from Northern Lake, England, and they said, now don't, don't we get in the dining car in England. Wait till we get to Paris or get to France. They said wine with the meal in Pat from the tiny car in Pat. <laughs> so he, she had a time there. They, they used to spend their vacations in Europe and uh, always had that on uh, a tree wheel next to the wheel. I went over one time and uh, had a large tuxedo, I think, from there. I went to the party that night. <coughs> His wife was there to look after the steward. And uh, he, he, Mr. Lowe would never, he didn't like to carry packages. Didn't have any life insurance, but he lived a good life. And he uh, would get somebody to drive him from Paris over because we were going to fly from Deauville an old BC-3 over to England, and this boat had collected a lot of uh, cream and uh, uh, peaches and, and a really big thing like that, with uh, the children trailing behind us. We started to, to customs in uh, England. <coughs> I thought the plane was going to come apart when we landed. And the customs man saw me coming, and he said, Sir, is this your party? I said, yes. He said, pass along. <laughs> wow. He didn't want to get mixed up with that crowd. With that crowd. Uh, talk a little bit about your wonderful mother-in-law, who, who I had the great pleasure of knowing and yeah, staying with. Yeah. Such a character. Yes, she was. Uh, she was an opera singer, one of the first to sing on the radio in 1921 in New York City. She was from New York City. Washington Square, I think. Uh, and, uh, she, uh, they were fortunate and able to buy the house next door to us because they didn't drive cars. <coughs> and he uh, soon gave up the business and sold it. And he moved down to Atlanta. And she was next door. So Lucy could run over next door and take care of her and uh, <coughs> drive them around. He took taxes in New York, but he was his taxi in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> How long? He was good. He was good on having his getting a, an apartment in New York City. 
but we look at Central Park on the 8th floor, mm -hmm. 2 floor in Central Park South. And I remember one year we got up there, and all the leaves was, had not come out on the trees. By the time we left after a week, they were beginning to come out on the trees. <coughs> but uh, <coughs> we uh, got tickets to the theater, and I knew we couldn't get a taxi afterwards. So we started walking east from the theater district to uh, El Morocco nightclub. And uh, Lucy got out in the street, the police there were in the cars, nothing wrong. But she hollered the taxes as they went by, El Morocco! In a few minutes, a great big Cadillac eased up and said, did you say El Morocco? We said, yes. He said, hot there. <laughs> so he took us straight to the place and could get a taxi from there back home. Fantastic. Marvelous. But back to the votes, they decided to stay in England during the war. That's right. See, the, one of the ships was sunk, what was it, the, the, the Athena. Athena was, had a lot of passengers on it, heading back to the States. And I think it was sunk, but that helped think of the mass state. And they had this modern building, and they went down in the basement every night. Then we went During out, the blitz. Yeah, I got there after the worst was over. But we, we got, uh, we, the people still, went down on the platform in the theater, in the underground, to sleep, make tea, and we get off the train, step over, and get over to the house. Even in 1944? Mm -hmm. mm. See, we still had some, uh, some uh, minor raids. And then, of course, um, after, after, our, after our wedding, the V-1 started, and then after that, the V-2 started. We couldn't do anything about the V-2, but we could get out of the way of the V-1s. And I remember being up on the roof one afternoon and seeing four V-1s coming our way. Whoa. So by the time I stopped down on the fourth floor, <laughs> they had turned off. Because when they turned off, you knew they were going to be slow. And we had one close call one night. Uh, it, quit, it quit on us over overhead. All I could do was grab the mattress, and it exploded in the garden of, uh, the road garden of, uh, what was the name of the park there, where we were. Anyhow, that's where it exploded. It didn't hurt anybody, but it did a lot of damage to glass works and big shops and things. One of the V1s. Mm -hmm. That was the V1s, but the V2s, that was just an explosion, and if they didn't, they hadn't captured the place where it was coming from in Belgium or Holland. They didn't have any real trouble out there because of the explosion. Mm -hmm. Couldn't do anything about that. One day, a Sunday it was, the explosion took place. Somebody said, well, that's just the gas tank, the gas works. But it did kill one man there. Before the crowd gathered around the, the speaker on the stand, you know, to talk and, uh, to the crowd. Mm -hmm. Then we went to a party on Park Way one night, and they turned out the lights, said, everybody go home, we got a, ride, a raid on. So we started walking. In each corner, we got up Baker Street, we had a lot of fire on it, and they, they put those out one at a time. But I think they were looking for Brandon's headquarters. We hadn't gone to England yet, no, we hadn't gone to France yet. And, uh, and, uh, but we got, uh, got home safely and uh, they put the fires out. They had water stashed around the other way. Well, back to your wedding, I must say that I was always told that my father was at both, I think, your engagement party and your wedding in London because uh, he was over there for the Atlanta Journal. And that's then, right, he was. And see, he took off from there to fly into France. That's right. He was one of the first people to land. D-Day. Went over with the paratroopers. Mm -hmm. paratroopers. Flew back to yeah. London. But he, because of the family connection there, he was at your wedding to Lucille. Yeah. Yeah. And I wish I could find it, and I will find it someday. But there's an article he wrote in the paper about yeah, it. Yeah, there is. Yeah, that's right. Had a picture of you. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that is either. And you had said that you 
learned somehow when he came back to London after being liberated from the prison camp yeah. and found him in the hospital, I guess. Well, he'd been shot in the leg. Right. And so we visited him in the hospital in London. Yeah. How, how did you find out he was in London? Atlanta sources. Yeah, the, <laughs> Atlanta. <laughs> yeah. It's the Atlanta the, Mafia. The, the Mafia. <laughs> That's right. Oh, my. Uh, well, he was very fond of you. Yeah, he was still. when he got in the hospital here with us. He was in Los in general here yeah. still. It's a miracle he didn't lose that leg. Mm -hmm. But he was very, very fond of you all. Yeah. So, Lucille had Stuart in London in 45, yeah. in June of 45. Yeah. And That's right. And you had gone home? No, I didn't go home till the following October. And Ms. Vogt helped look after Stuart mm -hmm. as a baby, because she had the apartment next door to our apartment. Somebody had left it because of the war, mm -hmm. so we took it over and paid the rent on it. And that was very nice because we take, could take meals over her house. Mm -hmm. and she took after the baby. <clears throat> but you were ordered to come home in October of 45. Yeah. And you were mustered out? Yeah. I went down, went down to Fort Main Crescent. I was ready to get out. I bet. And I remember they gave me an examination and then gave me $300 cash and said goodbye. And you were ready to say goodbye? Yeah, I, I was. But uh, we, we uh, didn't fare well in the, in the Right after the war in Atlanta, people didn't have money, didn't uh, do things. In our firm, we uh, picked up in 54, things began to change, and we never looked back there. We've grown considerably since then. But right after the war, everybody was sort of broke, and that was going on. What kind of law did you practice? Uh, real estate. I did title work for uh, before the title companies took over. So once Atlanta got into the building mode, things really picked up for you. Yeah. Well, that's right. And uh, one of the big items was the Council of the Light had a plan for the to, they would lend them the money for a home below what the building and loans were called the charge. But they also bought uh, an insurance policy. And that that would grow as the as the loan got smaller, the the, the growth of the uh, of the uh, insurance policy. Yeah, yeah. That gets gets to a point where you can swap the policy for the of the loan. And so some could stay on, some could. So we did a lot of that for a while, back in the 60s. <clears throat> yeah. Go back a minute to your brother, or your youngest brother. How did he wind up flying P 38s, which were arguably the hottest plane around and one of the most difficult to fly? I don't know how he did it. I wasn't there. He, uh, I, remember, I don't know whether you remember two uh, characters in Atlanta who later were running the uh, P-38 school. My father had said they wanted to wear the powder and lead to shoot them with. But they turned out to be real good administrators for teaching the P-38. And I don't know where it was that he went. Uh, at one point, Ted, uh, Ted Will was with him. What Ted did, he, he used to, was good at drawing pictures and advertising things. Hmm. And, you know, the, 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 the. and uh, uh, he flew home when Cock was born, I think, from Oklahoma City or somewhere out there, in the P 38. He took his P 38 and came home. Yeah. And uh, then they went to Press Prescott, Maine, and took a, a plane trip, a plane from there over to England. And they went there, yeah, 
Mount, Mount Farm near Oxford, very close to London. And I'd go over there and see him. And he took me up in a small plane one time. I was glad to get out because he was pretty, pretty heavy. The wind was blowing. Uh, but uh, I stayed with him a while. And did you get to see your older brother much? Yeah, yeah, after the war, after, 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 after D-Day was over. But Philip on. was in D-Day. Yeah, yeah. He was a man who wrote his wife a long letter after the survival, which he still has. And, uh, uh, but he got a vacation in uh, England, and we were vacationing too down on the Dorset, on the channel. And he came and visited us there. But uh, Bob is the one that, that won all that money in the poker game and really recovered the London West End that night <laughs> before he left the next day. Uh, there was, so things weren't quite as grim in London as people sometimes portray. No, not, not during the war. You could get, well, you could eat and drink that. But after the war was over, that was all, something went wrong. The, the distribution center got iced in, and they couldn't get the coal to get the, to burn the, make the electricity. And they had a terrible time for about four months there from uh, uh, November to uh, March. The wall was in the, in the apartment house was real sticky or something like that. And it was just, 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 just cool. Um, yeah. But she wanted to wait until she could get a plane over. And then they got a plane and it stopped in Ireland and they had a wonderful meal in Ireland. And uh, Stuart wouldn't go to anybody, even the stewardess. So we just sort of had to eat and take care of him too. But uh, then she had to wonder what I looked like in my civilian clothes. <laughs> she recognized you. Yes, she did. And uh, they found a nurse for us who took care of us to a wheel through a central park while we were living in the classroom. <clears throat> they had, had some friends from New York City and they did that. And they took care of us. So you stayed there a little while before you brought Lucille to Atlanta uh -huh. to meet your family. Yeah. Mother had gone up. Oh, she did? But she had got uh, something tested, and she had to come home. Mm -hmm. So she usually didn't have to arrive by the time she left, but she was in the class of two, waiting for this girl. But she was in the hospital at Emory. Dr. Grove did the operation, and uh, I took Lucille out to see her. So the first meeting was in the hospital? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, We, uh, we took, took a train out of New York City to Atlanta. And I remember waiting there, not leaving until about 10 o'clock that night. And this little colored boy, he pitched a fit about nothing we didn't know. But his family just sat there looking at him, and he was <laughs> all over the place, hollering and yelling, screaming. They didn't do anything about it. Anyhow, we went down to get the drawing room on the train. The Red Cross girls had thought they had it, but they didn't buy it, so they moved out very quickly, no problem. So we had the, the, uh, uh, the drawing room on the train, and uh, it stopped at Greenville coming home, mm -hmm. and my family was up there to see us. And Stuart all dressed up uh, in, whip, in heavy clothes, mm -hmm. Because it was in warm and in green and green. Yeah, but they came up to see us on, off on the train. Back to Atlanta. Mm. Yeah. So Lucille, of course, got along beautifully with your big family. Yes, yeah, she did. She certainly did. did. Made a place for herself here in Atlanta. Yes, yeah, she did. And then everybody was good to her. They put her in the junior league and the garden club. <coughs> and, uh, she learned to drive. I was trying to teach her how to drive, she didn't do it She said, you just don't want me to learn to drive. I'm going to go get some lessons. So she got some lessons, 
and the man let her drive through five points. Oh. <laughs> so, so she thought she had one over, and she did. Oh, oh man. Well, for the days. Yes. Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful. It has. It really has. Thank you. You all had a very special life together. Yes, we did. Yeah. And now, as I say, everything had to fall in place. Otherwise, we never would have happened. Right. little divine intervention there. Yeah. <laughs> all those Alstons at St. Luke's over so many years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She knew more people in St. Luke's than she did at Sacred Heart. Did she? She, she stayed a Catholic. She stayed a Catholic. But she didn't mind still being a Episcopal. Mm -hmm. And she was not the very prominent in the Catholic. She just wanted to be a Catholic. Yeah. As her mother was, her father was a, had been a, a Episcopalian in Louisville, Kentucky. He said he got 25 cents in the choir for funerals and 50 cents for weddings. <laughs> Got the priorities right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, thank you so very much for, for coming in on this Valentine's Day. Yours is well, really a wonderful Valentine's story. If you all got any questions. It's a beautiful love story. Hmm? It's a beautiful Valentine's story. <coughs> oh, good. Yeah. Uh, Miss Lucille, still. Yes, I do. So wonderful to be with you. Yeah, yeah I miss her a lot. It was a storied marriage. Mm -hmm. It was a storied marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As I wrote you at her death, I, yeah. you all were a very special couple. Yeah. Really? Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. yeah everybody was it was nice. You had a big crowd at the funeral. And, uh, uh, it was held at St. Luke because one of the pastors there knew the Monsignor at the Immaculate Conception downtown. And he gave the sermon at St. Luke's. Oh, nice. Yeah, but I uh, rode out to the cemetery with us. But he gave a good sermon at the by the uh, And Cotton gave the uh, layman's uh, eulogy or homily for Lucille. And very good. He was five weeks older than Stuart. Both war babies. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, Holloway looked after her when she got to Atlanta. But over there, the, uh, I think he was the doctor for the, for the embassy. I think he was from Memphis. But he had the idea to put a uh, thing in the back of the spine. And she saw Stuart Bowen. Whoa. Yeah, she, oh, an he, epidural, he, he I think. Mm -hmm. And he, she was always involved. It's impressive. Yeah. 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 I that know. happens now sometimes, but I don't yeah. think it was common back then. No, uh -huh. it went, it went, went through with it when you got to Amanda. Mm. She, she did the regular thing. The, the regular way, yeah. yeah. But it was, old St. Joseph had, didn't have any air conditioning, and they had a rubber sheet on the bed. And Lucy was on that rubber sheet, very uncomfortable, after Amanda arrived. And I went to a party at the driving club on the terrace. And Lucy heard about it. She didn't think much of that. <laughs> <laughs> Took a while to get over that one. Huh? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, thanks again. Thank you. Thank I'm you. Glad you enjoyed it. To do it. I, time is going on now. People forget to do it. It's good to do it yeah. while you remember all these wonderful yeah. stories. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. And with Thank your you. permission, we're going to give a copy to Stuart. Mm -hmm. This tape. Well, I mean, of oh, yeah. this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, good. Oh, good. Which I think might add a little color to what he already knows. Right. But mm -hmm. yeah. That's fine. And also good for the, the grandchildren. When yeah. They love having a copy yeah. of this. How we turn this on. Okay. All right. I'm not. Oh.